Hello, Trailblazers, and welcome to another edition of Entrepreneur Journey. Today, I am thrilled to have Cassie Lincoln with us. And Cassie is my first Harvard graduate um, that I've ever had on the program. And that's pretty exciting for me because I've, I've never interviewed someone that has gra graduated from Harvard before. So how are you today, Cassie? Great. How are you? I, I'm doing wonderful. So uh, first off, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started into the kind of getting to know you questions. Oh, sure, sure. Um, well, I'm Cassie Lincoln. I uh, live in the U.S. out in California. I'm in the Bay Area. Just moved out here, actually, earlier last year uh, from Houston. So, um, you know, I kind of consider both, both places home at the moment. Um, I am married, have a dog uh, that I love to take for walks and just hang out with. At the moment, I've still been working from home the last couple of years and really kind of gotten into that. I really love it. So yeah, just a little, that's just a little bit about me. Nice. Uh, a couple of questions about that. You said Houston, right? Yeah, I sure uh, did. Now, I know you probably haven't been in California long, but do you have a preference over the two? Well, it's an interesting question. I've lived... Um, in Houston twice, as well as the same area of California twice. Both, okay. both it's associated with my uh, career. Uh, so I've spent about equal time in both places. I actually love both areas okay. and for different reasons, but I really love them both. Like with the Bay Area, obviously we've got this beautiful weather uh, that is just phenomenal. And being in Houston, a lot of the time can make you really appreciate the weather <laughs> that we're getting here. Uh, I just love everything there is to do like in the outdoor space here. Uh, with Houston, I just love the vibe of mm. Houston. It's just so diverse and there's so many different things going on all the time. And everyone is, it's just such a, um, everyone's just so nice. It's just such a great, it's like this huge city, but like sort of hometown community feeling. So I just really love that about Houston. So um, I live in the South, so I can, I, I know kind of what you're talking about, about yeah. like, even no matter how large the, the town seems to get, it still has that kind of everybody kind of get, knows everybody kind of feel and, and yeah. friendly. So yeah. Um, Really cool. And uh, one more question about the dog. Um, what kind sure. of dog is it? Well, she's a mix. She's, I think, mostly Lhasa. Okay, I think. nice. But she's also got some Poodle and Maltese. Not 100% sure the complete makeup, but she's uh, pretty small. She's a um, little bit under 15 pounds, but she's a lot of fun. She, I call her my coworker. She pretty much spends most of the day with me. She sits on, she actually sits on my desk and looks out the window most of the day and kind of loves to look at the other dogs walking by, mm. probably wishes she was out there with them, but it's, it's really fun. She's, she's a cute dog. Nice. Um, I have a, a mutt too, a mix, a mutt, whatever you call it. Um, and I love him to death. He's, he's an old guy now, but um, he's, he still thinks he's a big, big, big dog, young pup kind of yeah the dogs like the big dogs across the street he'll he'll go right up to him like and they'll be growling at him and he'll be like what what come at me <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's like, how rice cakes is she's that, that's her name rice cakes. yeah nice she's, uh, she's small but mighty uh she <laughs> she feels like she she'd take on any any dog in the neighborhood i think <laughs> nice 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 all right, so um, some more getting to know you questions. If you could travel back in time at any point in history, when would that be? That is such a, um, that's a hard question. There's so many interesting things, but I was thinking about this and one of the time period or, or a place I should say that really has always fascinated me with its history is Hawaii. Mm. Uh, I feel like I would love to go back in time to the point in Hawaii's history before, um, you know, like before the U.S. came in, before all of that. And I'd love to just kind of like soak in what it was like to, to live in such a remote place, but has such a wonderful culture and just really kind of feel what that was like. That, yeah. So that's sort of, I think that's my top pick. That's pretty cool. It'd be like paradise without the cor uh, corporate 
Um, it's yeah. like there'd yeah. be no commercialization. Um, it'd just yep. be just be you and nature, um, which would be really cool. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that the history of the people that um, have lived there is so um, fascinating. I've like read a lot of books about, you know, it's things like um, in the language having so many different words mm. for water, um, you know, and, and I, it just, you know, it's just really interesting because you think, well, that makes sense. I mean, you're on an island, it's all around you and um, it's so meaning. It's like when you hear about other cultures that have a lot of different words for snow. I mean, it's mm. kind of the same concept. So this is things like that. I think that have always fascinated me. So nice. I think that would be cool. Um, I have a follow-up question to that because sure. you mentioned languages and I know that you at least speak one other language. How many languages do you speak? Uh, I would say fluently, mostly just the English, but what I'm actually... My other language is Japanese. Nice. I'm a little bit out of practice and I'm wanting to change that. That's like a little personal goal I have this year is to get some, get refreshed. What it is with Japanese is I'm, I'm actually pretty fluent when it comes to reading it, mm. but I'm not so great at speaking it. Like I can actually comprehension, like to listen, I'm, I'm pretty decent at as well, but I just fall apart when it comes to the speaking. I think I need, what I need is to take a trip There you go. Yep. <laughs> and really get immersed and then yep. that, that'll do it. But yeah. definitely a goal for my, for this year is I'm really wanting to kind of pick it up again and, and get, um, dedicate some time and really work on that speaking aspect. Nice. Yeah. I've always heard that's the best way to learn a language is just go get yourself immersed in the culture and have to use it to survive. Well, basically to survive, to yeah. ask about, for food, ask for water, ask for where you, right. where, where the bathrooms are. Yeah. Um, so uh, awesome. So what's your favorite zoo animal? For a zoo animal, I would have to say sea otters. Ooh, yeah. They're super cool. Um, they're so cute. They look like they're having fun all the time to me. Yes. They also yeah. look like they have a good sense of humor. They do. They do. I have to agree with that. That's pretty cool. What's the longest you've went? Now, this might go back to the Harvard days. I don't know. What's the <laughs> longest you've gone without sleep and why? Yeah, I was debating if this was either, I think the last time wasn't actually an exam. Um, I think it was a flight from mm -hmm. Manila to Houston. Okay. I, for whatever reason, I think what it was is I just was just not in a, I wasn't very sleepy to begin with. And I don't know, you know how sometimes when you get on a really long flight, for me, I start kind of binge watching movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I don't know, they just particularly that flight had like several movies that I was kind of had been wanting to watch and hadn't had time to. And I just sort of settled in and, <laughs> and, and watched one after the other. And next thing I know, the lights are coming on and they're <laughs> about to serve breakfast. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. Nice. I did not sleep at all. <laughs> yeah, I find it very hard to sleep on planes. Um, I don't know if it's just because we're in the air and I just got to feel like I got to stay awake. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you know, what's funny is I'm actually, normally I'm the opposite. And something about mm. the hum of that engine just sort of mm. puts me to sleep. But I don't know if I was just in just a mood. I was extra sort of just hyped up or something. I don't know, but it just didn't happen that particular time. But I think it might have worked in my favor a little bit on the jet lag a bit mm. for staying awake. Oh, um, yeah. Because usually I have a really hard time coming back from like Asia when I'm coming back to the U S but it seemed to go a little more smoothly this last time. <laughs> nice. And I, it probably was like a whole day's difference, right. By the time you got back. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, so let's dive into your entrepreneur journey now. Sure. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of background, education and experience in business strategy? Because I know that's one of the things that you're an expert in. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, in terms of background, like I can go back to like, I actually got my bachelor's in political science and that was at the University of Arkansas. And so that's where I got my, that's kind of where I started my career was in Arkansas. Um, and then, but not, not long into that is when I moved to Texas and to Houston. And um, I got to put that 
political science degree to work in Houston and worked in politics, worked on a mayor's campaign and um, just kind of loved that work. And then um, from there, um, I, I, I really worked before my, before starting in more of a corporate role, I really worked quite a few different um, kind of contract, like short-term jobs where that were either nonprofit or, or political. And um, one thing I really love about having worked in smaller business first is I just think you really get very resourceful when you, mm. um, it, it just kind of teaches that, that skill to where, you know, I have this need, how am I, how am I going to fulfill that without, you know, a lot of funding? Mm. <laughs> and so um, that that was a, a really good learning time frame for me. Um, so from there, um, I moved to California, uh, and and that's actually where I started uh, my corporate uh, my corporate role, which I've been in for about fifteen years, and. It's that in and in and of itself has been a really uh, interesting journey uh, working. It's a, a, you know, it's a fortune 100, really large company that has just tons of opportunity within the company itself without even, you know, having to say, look outside of the company for different roles. So I spent a lot of time mostly in the um, HR workforce development space, but um, always got a lot of really fascinating opportunities to work on different projects. And uh, my last or the last several years have really been focused on a lot of digital transformation uh, that specifically go into the HR space. But uh, I, I work a lot of the change management aspects of that. And then I, I suppose just adding to my, my educational background is I as mentioned, I went to Harvard for a business degree, a master's degree. And so um, that's where I did a lot of focus in business strategy in terms of kind of where I, I focused a lot of my um, back, like educational background in. And, and I love what I learned there because it's just been such a practical education that, you know, I can really apply um, to, to really everything I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really, um, really great back background that, that I've really drawn on a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's one of the best degrees you can get is in business because it's so applicable in so many different ways. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And I, my, my daughter, I think she's going to go into physical therapy, but um, I would love to have her have some background in, in business because it's very adaptable. It really is. Um, almost everything kind of having some sort of, even if it's a minimal educational background in business and strategy, I think it's just hugely beneficial because at some point you're always going to need to draw upon, you know, some of the basics of, you know, how do you get clients? How do you, mm. um, you know, how do you put together a plan for what you're trying to achieve? So, um, so great, great stuff, really. Nice. Now, I know I, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you're fairly new to coming into the entrepreneur world after being in the corporate world for so long. Yeah. Um, now, how does having such a long, successful corporate career, what experiences and things have you learned from, from that that will apply to your role going into being an entrepreneur as well? Uh, yeah, I, I think a big one is, um, I think within the corporate career, I have worked with so many different organizations within the company itself. I think it's really kind of helped me almost be, it's almost like I've been an internal consultant. So I'm able to really work with all kinds of different stakeholder groups. And I think that's something that I'm really benefiting from in you know, getting a business started is, is really understanding a lot of different perspectives, a lot of um, different challenges. I also, from my corporate role, really got a global perspective because a lot of what I did, a lot of my work, especially like the last, you know, seven years or so, 
I really did more at an enterprise level. So I was often really having to interact a lot outside of the U.S. And what I love about that is just um, I love kind of immersing myself and trying to understand a different, you know, different cultures, but also just different ways of working as well. And I think that that's helped me when I think about in my, um, in my business, it just helps me put on, put myself in the other person's shoes a little bit. I think sometimes I really, since I've been exposed to a lot of different things, I, I can kind of say, okay, it must, it might be kind of like this experience that I went through or this person that I sort of talked to. And so I think that helps a lot. Yeah. I, I think, especially like from a sales perspective, right. If you're, if you're doing sales with someone from another culture, it helps to know like the way that they think or the way that they respond to things because yeah. um, it, it will help you in negotiations and with sales. So. Yeah, that's awesome. That's right, because it's so easy. You can inadvertently <laughs> um, insult someone right. without mm-hmm. really even realizing it. And so uh, kind of having that exposure to kind of know, even if you don't remember per se the exact, you can you can kind of say, yourself, you know, in the back of my mind, I remember I, I worked on X, Y, Z. And I think there's something I need to maybe use uh, Uncle Google to <laughs> refresh myself <laughs> yep. on a local custom or something like that, that, that I don't accidentally, you know, say something that's disrespectful or anything like that, that, because I certainly would never want to do that anyway. (laughs) So, um, so yeah. Right. So you're going from a fortune 100 company to a small business. What, this is kind of a similar question, but what principles and fundamentals do you feel like work with any size of business? I think with any size business, kind of going back to the goals and strategies, I think that's something that every business needs, whether you're one person or you're a company that has like 100,000 employees. I think that, I think sometimes it gets tricky because I think that sometimes we kind of think, well, you know, we want to be responsive and, and we want to adjust. And I'm, I'm definitely a big fan and supporter of adjusting your strategy if you need to. But I think that when you're clear with yourself about what you're trying to do, I think it only helps you. Um, you know, we kind of, if you're on like Facebook and social media and things, you'll see a lot of postings out there. People talk about like squirrel syndrome or things like that. mm -hmm. And if you, if you're not really kind of grounded in, you know, I, I'm really looking to focus on this. You really can very easily get sucked into different things. Oh, that looks interesting. Maybe I'll try that. And it's not that that's necessarily a bad thing. I just think you need to be thoughtful about it Mm -hmm. and think, you know, I've heard about this. It doesn't really align with my goal. Is it something that I think it's really worth? Maybe I do need to add a goal that has to do with this. Or am I just kind of excited about something that looked a little bit shiny? Maybe I just for now need to make a note and kind of table it and continue on what, I'm, what I've been working towards. Yeah, that, that's very good because what I like to call it is entrepreneurial brain because as entrepreneurs, oh, I like this idea, I like that idea. Yeah. And sometimes it pulls us away from our primary focus. So you're, you're so right on um, with that. You got to you gotta, you gotta stay on focus. Otherwise, you're, you, 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 that's where overwhelm comes in, right? You're trying to do too many yeah. things at once. So um, it's hard. I'm like, yeah. I, I'm like that with, like you said, entrepreneur brain. I love that because that's exactly, I get excited. I get a lot of ideas. I get a lot of things I want to do. And uh, I can very easily go down all kinds of different paths. And sometimes I just need to kind of say, you know, I really need to just focus on this is my business. This is what, you know, I'm working to do. And this is how I've decided that I want to help people. Um, so I want to be true to it and, um, you know, stay the course that I'm on, but be, I, I say stay the course, but, but keep the, keep, keep your eyes open. I mean, you, you can, I mean, with the way the world is and have the pace of things of the way they happen, you know, if you see that opportunity, I, I think it's fair to say, go for it. But again, like I said, it's sort of like be thoughtful about it. Just don't jump in, you know, 
challenge yourself to take that step back and, and think it through and think about it in your broader context of what you're trying to do. Very true. Uh, another thing that I, a way that I like to think about it is, is if I have that idea, I like to shelve it, right? Um, so it's there on the shelf so I can go get access to it when, when, I'm, when I'm ready for it. Um, but right now it's, it's not, I'm not going to invest my time, but it's there for when I'm ready to, to pick it up and run with it. That's right. I agree. All right. Awesome. Um, so let's talk about what advantages a small business would have over a large corporation and, and vice versa. Yeah. For a small business, for sure. It's, it's, it's actually what I was just talking about. It's, it's that agility to be mm -hmm. able to easily pivot. Uh, it's the ability to quickly make decisions if you're an entrepreneur that either it's maybe, maybe it's just you, or maybe you've got some employees, maybe you're not, don't have like a huge group. It's a lot easier for, for you to make those decisions than it is for a bigger company that really has to go through a lot of channels to, um, you know, adjust internal business plans or get budgets changed or get the buy-in from other groups or senior man or even executive level management. So, you know, one thing for corporate, it, it, it can be hard, you know, when you see those opportunities, it can be very hard to pivot because you have to do a lot of work internally to, to get others to understand the value of an opportunity. Whereas if you can move pretty quickly when you're small. Yeah. Um, the flagpole gets bigger, right? When you talk about taking it up the flagpole, the larger the business, the higher the flagpole gets to take That's it up. That's right. So, That's exactly. Um, or, or like the whole moving a ship, the smaller ship, it easier is to turn. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so I think um, about that canal last year, that poor <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. debacle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It can, it can be hard. You can get a little stuck sometimes, I, I think with a bigger company. Um, I think on the other side, I think you asked about the you know, if you're a bigger company, what advantages do you have? And I, I think a lot of times it, it it's resources. Um, it's things like, I, I know for myself, like I'll, I'll be thinking about something in my business now and think, gosh, you know, I wish, I wonder, maybe I should check with legal on this. Well, I don't have a legal <laughs> to check with. So I'm going to have, if it's really that, if I'm really that concerned about it, I'm going to have to go have to find an attorney that uh, is in whatever area that is that I need to um, check on. So it's things like that, where when you're in the corporate world, you kind of have the advantage of, of saying, hey, you know, I, I would like some advice on X, Y, Z. And, and you can just kind of look in the company directory or mm -hmm or ask your, your manager or whomever, like, hey, can we connect on this or whatever? And there's usually somebody there that can pretty quickly just kind of give you the advice that you're looking for. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think that's, that's a definitely a big advantage there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so let's dive into um, some, a bit about your expertise now. Sure. Uh, talk to the audience about your views on, because I, I did hear this on your on your podcast, goals versus strategies. Tell us yeah. the difference. Yeah, actually, um, thanks for that. That's, um, I was looking at my podcast history. That's my most downloaded um, episode nice. at the moment. Nice. Yeah. Um, goals versus strategy. I think it's really important to make the distinction. And I, I think I think there's a tendency to maybe mix up or even combine the two uh, sometimes. And what I mean by that is um, when you think about what a goal is, you know, it's, it's an aspiration. It's something you're looking out ahead and you're saying, I, I want to achieve this. Your strategy is more about, okay, I've decided I want to achieve this. The strategy is how am I going to achieve whatever that is? And that sounds simple enough, but I mean, I, it can still be hard. It sounds weird to say that it's hard, but like uh, as an example, and I think this is the, even the same one I use on the podcast, the, um, I've actually heard where someone might say, hey, my strategy this year is mm -hmm. to grow my market share by 5% in this particular area. Well, that's actually not a strategy. That's, that's a goal. Mm -hmm. Your strategy would be more, well, how are you going to grow that market share? Is it, um, are you going to launch a new product? Are you going to maybe partner with another company? Are you, 
Are you going to just increase your marketing and sales? I mean, there's a lot of ways you could you could go about that. So that strategy where that comes into play is really thinking what's the best way to do this? What's the most cost effective way to do this? The fastest way. So that that's where it gets um that's where your strategy becomes really important. Yeah, and it's it's valuable, it's not valuable, it's pivotal that you have both, that you have a goal and you have a strategy. A goal without a strategy is likely not going to be accomplished, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. So and, and your strategy has to go somewhere. That's so. right. That's right. You could, I mean, you could, I mean, you know, it's hard to, you want your strategy to be working towards something rather than just something extremely broad. And I think the other reason I'll just mention the importance of this, if you're the type of entrepreneur that is going to start looking for investors, maybe you're really trying to scale you know, you're really, they're really going, investors are really going to expect you to have your goals and have a strategy. Um, so it is pretty important to make the distinction and make sure you're communicating it um, correctly and in a way that your investors would understand. And likewise, I'd say the same for your employees. Um, I think you're, uh, you know, if you're a entrepreneur that, that is starting to, you know, have an employee base, um, you know, they're a, they're a valuable stakeholder group for you and, and um, you want to make sure that they understand what, what the goal is and how they're going to help you get there. So it's, it's you know, super important if you're, if you're kind of muddling it, it's harder for, for those groups to really be able just to help you, which is, you know, what they want to do. It's really interesting that you said that about the, the employees because uh, my guest that hasn't it hasn't been released yet, but the uh, previous guest that I had, Tom Ziegler from Zig Ziegler Corporation, um, he is very um, he talked about empowering your employees pretty much that you give them what is their goal, what are, where do they want to achieve, and and how do you help them achieve it, and if you they will they'll buy into your your mission if you help them achieve what they want to achieve in, inside your company, so. 100% love yeah. that. Um, yeah. I, I think that gets overlooked. Actually, I'm doing a series. I, I even had a little bit of one episode episode dedicated towards it. I, I call it kind of, I call it keep rec recruiting your workers where, mm. you know, you don't want to think just because I've hired somebody, I've, I've, okay, now they work for me and that's that. No, you're, it's really just the beginning of a relationship with that person. And it needs to be mutually beneficial. And you have to do more than just say offer medical benefits these days. It's, yeah. it's uh, people want to be engaged in their work. They, they want to, um, they've got options. It's definitely an employee market out there in terms of hiring. Um, so it's really important that as an employer, that you've got, that you're giving them that value for working for you and that you, you need to build the trust mutually, invest in them and they'll invest in you. So nice. Nice. I love that. So let's go back to goal setting for a second. What resources um, would be, what resources are out there for, for goal setting? What would you recommend? Yeah, there's some really good ones. Um, First off, I would say it's really pretty good to, to maybe research some different frameworks for goal setting. I mean, a lot of folks, of course, are pretty familiar with SMART goals, and that, that is one, I would say, just kind of refresh on, on what that means, because if you can structure your goal in a way that is achievable, it, it helps. Um, otherwise, sometimes if you're too broad with your goal, it it's too fuzzy, it's too, you kind of don't even know how to write the strategy for it or think of what that strategy is. So definitely I would say, look at some of those frameworks. Uh, the other thing I would say in terms of a resource is I would say don't discount your own intuition <laughs> as mm. your resource. Uh, I think for me, I feel like entrepreneurs actually have a lot of really great, um, I don't know. It's like a intuition about the markets they're in. Uh, it's probably, I would say built on just knowledge of just 
how you've built your knowledge of, of where you are over the years and you really start getting those sort of gut instincts. Um, I think I'm a believer of listening to those, but pairing it with some data, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say just dive in with only your gut, mm -hmm. but I think that, you know, it's very much a big, um, you know, a lot of things that we hear right now because technology is so huge. You kind of hear, oh, let's make data-driven decisions. Let's, mm -hmm. let's gather all this data. I would say use data as one tool, uh, but use your intuition as another tool. Um, and, and don't kind of, don't overlook, don't bypass one for the other. So I, I would say those two things are a, a big resource. The other resource, um, maybe this is a little connected to intuition, but I actually think that just, I'm, and, and you can set yourself up with like a OneNote or even a calendar. I, I like to do bullet journaling a little bit because I kind of like we talked about earlier, I get a lot of ideas and things that I want to put on the shelf. And so I don't like to write long, long things, but something very quick that I can, you know, maybe a few times a week, just go and write in, you know, I had this idea or this happened, or I had this struggle. And where that's great is depending on what kind of cycle you're using, if maybe if you, if goal setting, if it's something you're doing annually, you can pull up that and really read through it. And you'd be kind of surprised at the ideas you'll come up with, especially if you've had a pain point during the year, because that's a good one to look back on and be like, okay, so I, I had this issue. And now that I'm reading this, I had this issue like 10 times last year. So uh, there's there's something there yeah so there's that's, a, there, that's what I would say there's a solution that needs to be found yeah, yeah. awesome yeah. um I want I want to touch on a part of what you said again uh, when you talked about intuition and data I'm I'm a I'm in digital marketing so data is big um I, I I make a lot of data decisions but you're right the the best entrepreneurs and marketers not only use data driven decisions they listen to the market they're, yeah. they're, they're I'm big on relationships too building relationships with within my market. So I'm always hearing what's going on, either whether it's colleagues or prospects, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I know when something that I'm offering fits the market or not, right? right. So, so yeah, I, I'm, that was a great point. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right. Um, and something else I saw on your podcast and her podcast is called One Minute Strategy, by the way. Uh, I get it just about everywhere that you get podcasts. Yeah, I think it's, it is like Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio. I think it's on all the major ones. I, I think the account just blasted it out, blasted it out everywhere. Okay. Uh, we will put a link below the video um, and in the show notes to uh, check out the One Minute Strategy uh, podcast of Cassie's. Um, but one thing that I saw on that podcast or heard on that podcast that I would like to dive into is optimizing a business before you automate it. Uh, can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, in my current business, um, that is one of my my core areas is really digital market or digital transformation. Excuse me. Um, so one one aspect of digital transformation is bringing automation into your business, and it's something that is so. Well, first of all, it's just really you know just to be I can't help but be excited about it. It's just super cool <laughs> for one thing, and. Secondly, it's got so much potential to, and to me for um, even smaller to medium sized businesses, because you've got this ability to take some business processes that you're using, you know, you've got employees maybe that are, that are working these, but then you have these really great ways that you can automate them and then free up those employees to do the higher value work. And so what I mentioned in this podcast was really about how it's a good exercise to, if you're considering automation is to, when you, let's say you've identified a business process and a lot of, honestly, some good ones to start off with, if you haven't done automations or things like um, invoice processing, um, mm. 
a lot of back office kind of things. Um, HR is actually a really good space. Uh, you can you can do a lot there. Interview scheduling, things like that. Um, but what you want to do, I I think where you get your kind of the biggest bang for the buck is if you can look at that process and say, okay, what am I doing? What, let me just map out how this process currently is working, like the exact steps that the folks in, in the business are doing to accomplish whatever this process is gearing towards. So what I have found is that as the business grows, uh, business processes kind of just accumulate, um, they just accumulate waste into the process. And it doesn't happen on purpose. Usually it's something like an issue happens and something is added into the business process and it just stays there. And it could have been literally a one-time issue. Um, I think of things like, uh, let's say, I actually have an example. Maybe I'll just share it. Awesome. Yes, very, please. very early career example when I was uh, actually still in college and had this part-time job working for this um, company that did, they sold a commodity product. And so we had a process and again, this has been quite a few years ago. So <laughs> we, we didn't have as many tools as we do today, but uh, the process really would be the customer wants to make an order. They would call the office and you would kind of take down what they wanted and enter it into the system. And then once it was in the system, uh, it would go through an approval process where it would go to a, there were a couple of managers that had the ability to review it and approve it. Once it did that, there was an additional step where it would come back to like me and my role where I would physically print off the order and I would circulate it to each person in our office area and they would all go through and check it and initial it and once they did that and it came back into my little inbox I would go back into the system and send it over to the warehouse so you know I never as a new employee I never really questioned that that's just how I was trained to do it mm -hmm. I had little like zero history as to why I am actually printing this off and sending it around um I come to find out literally like months later, there was an incident that where a mistake was made on an order and in the system, the manager didn't catch it. For some reason, it just didn't stand out or whatever. And so because we were so, the, the company was so uh, worried that this particular incident would happen again, they wanted to have basically six pairs of eyes on it before mm -hmm. <laughs> before we even sent it to the warehouse to wow. actually pull the order and ship it out. So to me, that's an example of a very one-off instance caused this big reaction, but what a, what a time waste to go to all those people and holding up an order from getting to the customer. That's what always got me was, you know, by the time you're routing it to these folks in a physical piece of paper, sometimes it was two or three days before it made it back into my inbox and I sent it over to the warehouse. So um, that just that's an example of how these business processes are just magnets for these types of little things that happen and it gets tacked on. So basically, if you want to automate, what you want to do is look through it and say, hey, do I have any of those extra steps built in here? Because I want to strip those out if that's the case because that's just gonna cost me more money when I automate. It's gonna add time to, to the, the developers that are putting that automation together. Um, the end product is basically, it's just gonna mirror what I'm currently doing. So if it's adding time now, it's gonna still add time into the automation. I mean, even though the automation is gonna still do it a lot faster, it's gonna do it that much faster if you optimize it first. And I think the other big thing about optimizing first is it really does help you make some design decisions about your automations. Um, you can really kind of think through, you know, you have maybe something that's going to be completely automated in your process. 
then maybe there's a part of your process where you need to bring your worker back into it um, to kind of do some of the, the higher level thought work. Um, so it just kind of helps you if you're familiar with the process, if you've stripped away any wasteful steps in it, um, you're basically just going to be really better positioned to design an efficient automation that's going to get you your ROI on it that much more quickly. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome. And that story that you told, I could just see the inefficiency, like they, they built out this process so much that we, instead of being efficient, it became inefficient. That's uh, right. Yeah. Um, it was well intended. I mean, yeah. we were, they were trying to prevent an issue, but but honestly, the customer was kind of the one that was paying for that in a sense, just because they were really it was hindering the ability to get it to the to the the product to the customer. Yeah, and and I think there's this battle that, and it's one of the things that we have in our company is take action, right? Do the do the imperfect action and 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 get going, but at the same time. You've got to step back and refine refine the process, just like just like you're talking about. You can't just keep taking that imperfect action um, and expect great results. You have to refine your processes. So um, once again, an excellent point. Thank you, uh, Cassie. It has been a pleasure having you on the Entrepreneur Journey today, and you've dropped so much value on our audience of entrepreneurs. And um, I'm sure that they're going to take a lot of what they've learned today and apply it and have have great success. So. Thank you for that. Um, where can people, what can, tell people what, um, how you can help them and where they can go to find that help. Sure. Yeah. I, I love to help people with, first of all, for business strategy, I'm more than happy to be a sounding board. If, if you want to reach out to me, um, I can do some coaching there if need be. Um, and then of course my main business is, um, you know, I'm managing partner with Valenta and, you can certainly connect with me at my email. Um, I guess maybe we could post it with you. We can. We can put it in the show notes. Okay. Um, just feel free to, to connect with me there. And um, I'm happy to, you know, give you a consultation, go through an overview of, you know, automation that might be available to you. Um, I just, my focus, I love to help businesses solve their pain points. Uh, so... So yeah, just feel free to call me because I just, <laughs> I just absolutely love trying to dive in and understand and, and seeing, you know, what, what could happen to really help make your business that much better. Yeah. Just knowing you this little bit, I can tell you're really passionate about problem solving. <laughs> Thank you. I am. I am. I am. Nice. I really am. Um, so I, I kind of have a little bit of understanding of what Valenta does. Can you just tell a little bit more about what Valenta does, help, what they do to help other business owners? Sure. Yeah. Valenta has basically three pillars that we use really to help a business grow and thrive is the way I look at it. We have this consulting arm where we can get, actually, it was, a, it was a lot like what I was describing. We can actually partner with you to help you optimize your processes. Um, then we have our digital transformation arm, and that's where we can really call on um, services like an automation or bringing AI into your mm. business, those sorts of things where we can really um, give you that, that technology edge um, that is, is becoming more and more important now. The other area that I love, and I love how well this pairs with the other two, because both of all of this really is about bringing you more efficiency. We have a virtual staffing arm where we can um, actually provide you you know, staff that you can offload work onto um, that kind of can help you, again, help your employees focus on, you know, higher value activities. And I would just say, really look at the website because there's a lot of, it's, a, a, there are a lot of places out there that do like virtual assistants. And mm -hmm. we have a really deep bench of talent. I've always, when I came with, um, when I started with Valenta and started my business here in San Francisco, I was literally just amazed and impressed with, you know, we've got para planners and medical transcribers and, um, I mean, you, you name it, we probably have it. And this, um, it's just, um, I've been working with a client uh, a little bit right now that I just adore that we have been able to bring them uh, a paraplanner 
that's helped them expand their business. They're, they've literally grown their business because they were able to offset this work. So um, anyway, that, that's really the main, I would say the main focus of Valenta are those three pillars and, and just really kind of helping you find where you can have efficiency and, and to grow your business. Nice. Um, if I could make one point about what you're saying about the, the virtual um, employee assistance of, of employees. Um, it sounds like what you have to offer, they're already trained to do the tasks that, that need to be done. Where as like I have in, I've had to bring people on and train them. So just having the value of them having being trained already before, before the job is, is ready to, to, before giving them the job is, is amazing. So um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's that, really cool. Yeah, our- the other, I love, the other thing I love, and, I, and maybe I'm extra passionate about this because of my HR background and having worked with a lot of different types of staffing, um, I love that our folks become, we like to say it's an extension of your team. It's not like you're sending work to some, like an invisible person you're never going to to interact with. Our folks really kind of really get engaged and invested in, in what you do in your business. And because they also, they kind of also have this macro view because they also get to work on other um, types of um, businesses as well. They can help you with best practices and all of that. So it's really just a huge value. Yeah. They probably have insights you didn't even know they would have. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Thank you again, Cassie. And um, I, I hope to uh, catch up with you again soon because you're in the Entrepreneur Journey Group. Um, and if anyone who's watching has not been to an Entrepreneur Connect on Fridays, they even had one in my absence today. Um, everybody likes to go to these things so much that um, they, they planned it without me. So uh, if, and, uh, it's Fridays at noon. So if you want to join a mastermind uh, one hour a week with other entrepreneurs, Uh, Fridays at noon Eastern time in the Entrepreneur Journey Group. If you're not a member, join. Um, I guarantee that you'll love being a member of the Entrepreneur Journey Group. So anyway, thank you again, Cassie. And uh, any any parting words for our audience? No, just um, really appreciate this time with you. And also just love to hear from you. Nice, nice. So until next time, uh, Trailblazers, keep moving forward.